Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. Manage your blood glucose levels, increase your possibilities. By Jivo Kypopin, the first pre-mixed auto-injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, it's been a year since Tandem Diabetes released their Control IQ software, hybrid closed loop technology to help increase time and range. Since that day, as we do around here, we've all been asking for changes. Tandem says they're listening. Can it be more aggressive? Could it be less aggressive? Could it, you know, do this or that? Could I pick my targets? Could I um, put a timer on exercise? Could I do all that? We are looking at all of those things. I would say nothing's off the table right now. Molly McAway Malloy, manager of clinical outcomes at Tandem, is back to talk about possible changes to control IQ, to answer your questions, and to look ahead at other tech in the Tandem pipeline. In our innovations segment, using your CGM to get more out of exercise and a new study for people with rare forms of diabetes. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome back to another week of the show. I am so glad to have you here. If you are just finding us and you are new to Diabetes Connections, welcome. We aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. My son was diagnosed with type 1 right before he turned 2 back in 2006. My husband lives with type 2 diabetes. I don't have any type of diabetes, but I am the broadcaster in the family, and that is how you get the podcast. It's funny to look back on this year because not only did you know, none of us have any idea what 2020 would really be like, but more to my point here, as I'm taping this on January 15th and planning to release on the 19th, this was a time when many of us in the community were just refreshing the tandem page over and over again <laughs> because Control IQ had been approved and many of us had already talked to our endocrinologists about it and trying to get the prescriptions. And if you remember that time, especially on social media and some of the tandem groups, it was a bit bananas. But we have been using Control IQ for a year now. Benny got his set up at the very end of January, as I recall. And they are not a sponsor of the show. They do not pay me to say this, but it's been absolutely amazing for us. It has really made a big difference. And you know, I don't share numbers. I'm not all about the numbers and straight lines with him, but I do want him to be healthy. And I think we were doing great before, but just back from the endo this time around, about a week ago, as you're listening now, his lowest A1C ever. And the time before that was his previous lowest A1C ever. And the best part is he's doing less work. And I am, I swear, I'm doing less nagging. If you ask him, he will tell you otherwise, but I promise you it's true. (laughs) So I'm thrilled to talk about Control IQ. I'm really excited that all of the pump companies are moving in this direction. It would be amazing for everyone to have access to this kind of technology. That is a discussion for another time, probably. Another little bit of personal news, Benny got his driver's license. I know I can't believe it either. Here in North Carolina, you get your permit if you want at 15. You can actually take driver's ed at 14 and a half, but you get your permit at 15 and you can get your license at 16. Right now, because of COVID, they are not even doing road tests. I know, isn't that bananas? But what happens is you get your basically your junior driver's license. He can't drive at night, which is what he would have been issued anyway if he'd passed a road test. And they cannot move on to the next level, the after nines, until they get a road test. In fact, I believe what he has expires in six months without a road test. So he'll have to take one. He's a decent driver. You know how superstitious I am. So I'm not going to say more than that. But I'm confident we've got a whole system with diabetes. We have we've had these discussions and he's just so excited about it. And I'm really thrilled for him that this step is taken. But as a parent and for those of you who have known him since he was two, how did this even happen? Okay, we're going to talk uh, to Molly from Tandem in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Gvoc Hypopen. And almost everyone who takes insulin has experienced a low blood sugar. You know that can be scary. But a very low blood sugar, it can be really scary. And that's where Gvoc Hypopen comes in. Gvoc is the first auto-injector to treat very low blood sugar. Gvoc is pre-mixed and ready to go with no visible needle. That means it's easy to use. How easy is it? You pull off the red cap and push the yellow end onto bare skin and hold it for five seconds. That's it. Find out more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the GVOC logo. GVOC shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. 
Visit gvoglucagon.com slash risk. My guest this week is the manager of clinical outcomes at Tandem Diabetes Care, and she lives with type 1. Molly McElwain Malloy is, I am grateful to say, a frequent guest. And if you're a longtime listener, you know her career and her life has been shaped by the technology that is now Control IQ. That's not really an exaggeration. She was one of the first to test out an artificial pancreas system, and she changed her career path because of it. I looked it up, and my first interview with Molly was in 2016 when Type Zero Technology announced their partnership with Tandem. And I will link up the previous episodes. We've done a a bunch with her all about this software. You can find those links, as always, in the episode show notes, wherever you are listening. The app should have show notes. If it's difficult to find, just head over to diabetes-connections.com. And every episode now has a transcript and and lots of links and notes to help you out. Please stay, though, to the very end, uh, beyond the interview, because there are a few questions Molly had to check on. uh, She couldn't answer at the time. And they sent me that information. And I will give that to you later on in the show. Of course, as I said, there's a transcript, so you can check it out that way as well. Molly, thank you so much for coming back on to talk to me. A year ago, you and I spoke about Control IQ. It had basically just been approved and you were kind enough to jump on then in late December. So thanks for coming back on. Oh, you're welcome. I'm very excited to be back on. This is fun. Yeah, well, lots and lots of questions, of course, from listeners and from me. But let's just start by taking a moment to kind of reflect. What's the last year been like for you guys at Tandem? You know, it's been really... Crazy great is the best way I could describe it. There's a lot of excitement for Control IQ, and rightfully so. And there's a lot of the feedback via social media about people's experience. And it's been really overwhelmingly positive. It's also been um, kind of emotional because this has been a, a rough time for everybody, right? Like last eight months or so that we've been in, I've been calling it seclusion, but it's, uh, you know, everybody working from home. And that's been a really high stress situation, particularly for people with chronic disease and myself included. So I've really been grateful that Control IQ has been out and approved and and a useful tool during this time because, as you know, stress influences glucose. Um, And so it's been a big, huge help for a lot of people, particularly during this time. So it's been crazy great and it's been busy, but sure, I would love to experience uh, Control IQ and and all the the interaction with uh, healthcare providers in person, but it's been great just talking to people on the phone or on video or teams. And it's been really good, but we've been really busy. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. So what I'd like to do is take a look back, get some information from you about Control IQ, and then kind of take a look forward because we know the product and the the product line is evolving. So let's just start by asking you, what have you learned about Control IQ? Obviously, you had all the study information, but looking back at 2020, how are people using it? How is it working out? What is the data telling you? You know, the, this is the funniest thing, and this is not something that you could plan or you could guess, but our real world data is better than our clinical trial data. And I, I'll say that again, because it's just, it feels a little crazy to say that out loud, because that's usually not the case, right? Clinical trials are very well managed and, you know, there's protocols and everybody's sticking to stuff. But it turns out when you put this, um, put control like you in the real world, where people are experiencing significant hyperglycemia or even hypoglycemia, it does even better. So, I mean, the clinical trial population was pretty well controlled, right? And we were still able to improve on that. But when you put it into the real world where people are doing, you know, they're real people, they're doing all kinds of real things and we're able to get even better outcomes. It's surprising. It's awesome. It's a really cool experience and definitely um, unexpected. Yeah. So let's dig into that. Can you tell us in terms of, uh, I guess you're measuring things like time and range. Can you give us a little bit more information about what you mean by they, they did better? So uh, for one, it's, it's time improvement on time and range, right? So in our pivotal trial, we had about 11% over baseline improvement on um, time and range from a very good, well-controlled group, which is awesome. But in real world, it seems to be closer to 13% um, and sometimes a little bit better. We've got some results from DQ&A, which is a third-party vendor that does research and they're affiliated with Diatribe. And uh, they did some survey results about time and range by insulin pump therapy. And it's been really cool. We have like uh, 33% getting 81 to 90% time and range, 31% getting 71 to 80%, 11% getting 91 to 100%, wow. which is crazy. 
so you know all of that and it and it just is amazing because it really does it whips up on the competition but it also just shows that you know this works even better in the real world any idea why i mean are people using sleep mode are people figuring out different ways to use it better I, i'm just curious what you think might be happening yeah i don't think it's the using sleep you know 24/7 or something i think using a sleep schedule has been very successful mm-hmm. but i think the reason for this is that largely and not everybody was correcting aggressively right so mm-hmm. um while there are that subset on facebook or social media that are trying to get that you know super super tight range there are plenty of people who between meals were not correcting and now they're receiving those corrections and there's some evidence uh, that we were able to publish in um i think we we showed it at ADA but that the persons with type 2 diabetes are are benefiting from this and that's because they're getting the corrections between meals which we don't typically ask people with type 2 diabetes to do that so yeah. getting that tighter control is is really really helpful and again not everybody does that <laughs> Yeah, I have one of those people in my house who not everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we I tease Benny all the time and he knows that I I talk about him on the show like this. He will happily let me say that control IQ has helped him significantly because he often boluses after he eats or forgets to bolus or didn't correct between lunch and let's say bedtime, even if he gave himself right. insulin for dinner. And it really has made that burden lighter. And it's certainly not perfect. I have friends whose kids are much more engaged with their diabetes, I guess is a way to say it, where they they will, you know, they'll bolus every two to three hours or they'll look at their watch every 20 minutes, but he's never been like this. And it's really improved his quality of life because I'm not, I'm not willing to make him do that. <laughs> well, and if you think about the long-term decrease to complications because right. of this going on in the background and sort of automating this, I mean, that's a huge improvement in quality of life. One of the things I'm really excited about is to watch this going forward to see how we can measure decrease long-term complications from this, sure. you know, the not only just glycemic variability, but with those micro and macrovascular complications, but those long-term complications from diabetes, from having high blood sugars. And, you know, that's just something that we've never been able to really control for before. So this is going to be um, very cool to watch and see how it plays out. No doubt. All right. We've gotten a little bit inside baseball, but I think most people listening to the podcast will understand some of the shorthand. I'll try to explain as much as I can. But if there are things that we mention that you are not understanding, I'm going to link up lots of stuff in the show notes. But one of those things is sleep mode. And I just want to take a second to talk about that because you and I, when we talked last year, you said that there were some people using sleep mode, which will adjust basal, but will not give you boluses. They were using it 24-7. In the studies, you called them sleeping beauties. And there oh, have yeah. been many, many people in the real world settings who use that. We do not. We actually, I'll, don't laugh at me. We stopped using sleep mode for sleep because as great as it was working for Benny, with what you called a seclusion, uh, we found that he was eating at interesting hours, you know, 1 a.m., 3 a.m. I mean, he went full nocturnal for about a month there, way back when, uh, I want to say like June or July. And so we turned off sleep mode because we needed that bolus power at weird times. So it's been really funny how you can kind of use the system in a way that works for you. But getting back to my question, what have you learned about sleep mode? Is there anything you can share with us? We'll get her answer to that question and what she can share in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. And we first noticed Dario a couple of years ago at a conference. And Benny thought being able to turn your smartphone into a meter was pretty amazing. I'm excited to tell you that Dario offers even more now. The Dario Diabetes Success Plan gives you all the supplies and support you need to succeed. You'll get a glucometer that fits in your pocket, unlimited test strips and lancets delivered to your door, and a mobile app with a complete view of your data. The plan is tailored for you with coaching when and how you need it and personalized reports based on your activity. Find out more. Go to mydario.com forward slash diabetes dash connections. Now back to Molly answering my question. We were talking about what Tandem has learned about the use of sleep mode. Yeah, yeah, there's lots I, I've learned. I just want to share quickly that I've yeah. seen in looking at, at lots of reports with lots of healthcare providers that during what I've been calling seclusion or, or hibernation, <laughs> um, this uh, 
this COVID time that people's schedules are very, very different. They're eating at different times and that sleep as originally intended, right, is not what it looks like during this time. So there's a lot of people who have benefited from not using sleep when they're eating right through the night or snacking or staying up extra late or like really altered schedules, right? So we've seen that some people have turned sleep off and that's been successful for them. So sleep, what sleep is doing is it's based off of fasting metabolism and it's using this 112 to 120 um, sort of target. And it's uh, really, it's a really tight range, but it's doing this through modulating basal. And the reason it's only modulating basal and not giving corrections is because someone is sleeping and they're not, um, we're not anticipating postprandial spikes and we're not anticipating exercise or activity. And so it's really, really meant for when you are kind of static uh, and you are sleeping. Now, that said, not everybody is sleeping normally, uh, particularly during COVID. And so it doesn't always work that way. And then some people want to have sleep 24 seven. So that the basal is modulating, but that they're responsible for the corrections. And if you're willing to glance and see if you need a correction every two hours, that can work really well. But if you want to alleviate that burden, right, then then sleep maybe isn't the best thing for you to use 24-7. So it really depends on the user and the user's interaction. But the other thing I wanted to mention about sleep for users is that one of the things that we've noticed and how people are using sleep is that if their schedule have, has changed drastically with COVID, um, that they may need to reevaluate that sleep uh, pattern as to what time it is. So for instance, if someone previously wasn't snacking at 10 p.m. and now they are, starting sleep a little later may make sense because they may need an additional correction before going to bed. You know, that's one circumstance I've seen a lot of. And another one is there are some patients who can't go to bed with a positive IOB. And what I mean by that is, you know, going to bed with any insulin on board that is not related to carbohydrates, right? Mm -hmm. So for correction and for them starting sleep sooner and, you know, obviously not eating uh, right before bed uh, makes sense because they're not getting any corrections before bed. So there's sort of really two very different types of insulin sensitivities, right? The person who's eating and and then needs the additional correction who may want to start sleep later. And then the person who isn't eating after dinner and really doesn't want any additional corrections before they go to bed, starting it sooner. So I've also seen that very interestingly playing out in the in the public realm. And it's it's interesting to see how people are, are using it to make it work for them. Yeah. What about exercise mode? Have you learned anything about how people use that? We don't often use exercise mode. Yeah, exercise is, um, is interesting because it's sort of like a temporary basal rate, if you will which you set indefinitely, right? Until you start it and you stop it. And we hope in future versions, we'll be able to put a timer on this. But for right now, you start and stop it. And so you could be in sleep for 24 seven if you wished. I have seen that be useful when people want to keep a higher target and want to be a bit more aggressive in preventing hypoglycemia. Right. So that's an interesting thing that has and can be used selectively, whether it's for exercise or just because you would like to keep up, you know, you need to be a little bit more conservative on the hypo end and you really do want to have a higher target, you know, in COVID times, looking at how particularly the aging population is trying to stay at home rather than go into care, using something that's going to keep them a little safer on the lower end and elevate that glucose level a bit has been useful. Uh, and just allowing people to remain, you know, at a safer range with preventing hypoglycemia. I'm curious too, if there are any best practices or any advice for starting the system. A lot of people who switched from um, basal IQ or other pumps or no automated system, you know, just a regular tandem X2. And I'll, I'll put myself in this camp. We were one of the first people on this in late January of 2020. We started on Control IQ before my endocrinologist, or I shouldn't say it that way. We started on Control IQ before Benny's endo was trained. So I was in touch with him, but he was like, tell me what you find out, basically. Like, <laughs> show me show me Benny's settings. Like, we're going to adjust as much as we can. But what are people saying? What are, what are the, you know, what are the experts saying? Trust me, my endo doesn't take advice from Facebook. But, you know, it was one of those situations where we were learning together. And luckily, he trusts us to do that. But Benny had, you know, we put his regular settings in and we had massive overnight lows. Yeah. And we had to adjust because of that five hour increment. We had to adjust basically everything works like a dream now, but it was a different transition than I had anticipated. I'm curious if you learned anything from that and, and what your advice might be now. 
Yeah, one of the things we noticed, particularly people going from basal IQ to, to control IQ, is that in basal IQ, they'd sort of artificially inflated their basal rates to sort of hug that line mm. at 80, right? Or because because it can always turn off, right? It's always preventing hyperglycemia. So why not up that basal rate a bit more? And with control IQ, it really takes that information and says, okay, that's where you are at baseline. And if that's really overly aggressive for where you are at baseline, then you're going to have hypoglycemia. So Getting optimized settings is super, super important. And we do still see that people going basal IQ to control IQ, that they've had really aggressive basal rates and need to need to back off of that or even really aggressive meal boluses, right? So sometimes getting that reevaluated with your healthcare provider, your diabetes educator can be really, really helpful, but also coming from other AID systems where you may not have as much information about, you know, what's going on with your basal rates or anything like that, that really just going, when in doubt, wipe it out, you know, go back to basics with your settings um, and with your provider and and making sure those are dialed in because control IQ is being a metabolic algorithm. It really does behave. And we really did design it around sort of insulin titration as we know it. So it's not any, any crazy math. It's not an occult science. It's, (laughs) you know, it's what your endocrinologist would use now for titrating insulin. And, And going back to those basics is, is really necessary to get a good solid start. So would you recommend maybe basal testing or just talking to your provider about what they think is best for your settings? Talk to your provider about what's best for your settings. I mean, I can't give any medical sure. advice on, on how to do that exactly, but there, there are known ways to do this, whether it's your getting your basal rate and your carb ratio and your correction factor all dialed in. Do that with your provider. I I personally hate basal testing. I will tell you that. <laughs> I don't like basal testing. The reason I don't like it is because when people are basal testing, they are altering their behavior from normal hmm. and it is not a true test, right? They're trying to avoid hypoglycemia. They're not doing their normal schedule because if you get hypo, right, and you have to treat, it's trash. You have to do it again. And so basal testing is, in my personal opinion, a nightmare and not a true representation of what the patient is actually needing during that time. So uh, what I would prefer to do is see how control IQ is changing baseline and then see what that looks like against what's programmed and kind of, you know, look at the difference between the two to get the feedback. So I really think basal testing is, you know, in theory, it's a good thing, right? But nobody basal testing is doing exactly what they were doing before that because they're not eating, right? They're trying to be careful about hypoglycemia. Sometimes you're just staying home all day to try to test this out because you have to do so many finger sticks or or what have you. So I don't think it's a really good representation of what's actually going on. I think, you know, looking at your total daily dose of insulin and talking to your healthcare provider, you can get that dialed in much better uh, with much less frustration. What I did with Benny, and I, I agree with you on the basal testing, we haven't done it in years and years and years for many of those reasons. But what we did that worked nicely is we made changes very slowly. And it can be very frustrating, but it really works well for us. Again, this is not medical advice. This is me personally, what we did. And it really helped. We made one change, basically. Like he went low at 2 a.m. So I changed the basal rate and we waited like three days. Then, and even if he went low, we treated, but we didn't change the basal rate. Then we worked on the insulin sensitivity factor. Then, you know, like it took us two to three weeks before we thought we might have it. And then we adjusted again about a month later. And if you, if you can be patient, which is so hard to do, you mm-hmm. know, people, especially, especially, and I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus too, especially us parents, we get nervous if anything's out of whack, right? We want everything to be perfect. What happened to my straight lines? And it's really hard to dial in the settings unless you're willing to let some of that perfection slide for a few days or weeks. But I'm telling you, do it slowly. It'll come out much better in the long run. <laughs> Well, right. And if you think about an experiment, like for instance, um, the, the one that often comes up in our household is my, so my husband likes to follow recipes and I hate following recipes, although I know it's absolutely necessary, right? Because if you don't get the flour and the sugar and everything else, right, it just tastes like dirt. So um, <laughs> particularly when you're baking, because I have done that, but it's very important to follow those recipes because if you alter, you know, one thing versus another thing, you're going to get a totally different result. So altering one thing at a time is very important in a scientific kind of experiment, which sometimes dialing and pump settings is is absolutely like that. Um, And you need to follow that recipe. You can't willy nilly. It's not an art, right? It's very much a science. There's no, there's no artfulness in this. So looking ahead, 
And I'm not sure how much you can tell us, but I'd love to start by kind of asking you about changes planned to control IQ. Benny has the first question here. He wants to know when the auto correction, right, that auto, I call it the auto bolus, but the auto correction, when that will be stronger, because right now it's 60% automatically. Yeah, it's 60% because we're also titrating basal, right? So the combination usually gets you closer to 100%. We are currently working on what that looks like um, and how we could do that safely. I don't know how quickly that comes to fruition, uh, but I can tell you that we are working on trying to understand how you would increase aggressivity without increasing hypoglycemia. You need a special teenager setting. I can tell you that right now. We need a teenager (laughs) aggressivity setting. That's That's for darn sure. Yes. Yes, we do. Well, maybe I should start by really asking you, what what are you looking at in terms of um, improving or changing control IQ? So we've, we've really listened hard to feedback, right? So one of the things we do at Tandem, which we do really, really well, is we do these surveys all the time, right? Constantly asking you, and you probably get these. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you want from this? What do you want for that? And then we look at the glycemic data and we do some comparisons because you can't just take what somebody wants as the absolute that would be best for everybody without looking at glycemic data. So we're kind of looking at both of those things to see how we can refine control IQ for something in the future that works better and something that people are even more excited about. So we're, we're looking at people's sort of concerns are how aggressive can it be? Can it be more aggressive? Could it be less aggressive? Could it, you know, do this right. or that? Could I pick my targets? Could I um, put a timer on exercise? Could I do all that? We are looking at all of those things. I would say nothing's off the table right now. I don't have any promises as to what comes first as far as the improvements go. Uh, I think, for, you know, the, the next thing that we've been working on sort of is that bolusing from your phone and being able to bolus from the app because that's been a big request. Oh, but yeah. I'm, I'm asking about that. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Because the, the thing, the cool thing about working as, you know, we're a software pump company, right? Yeah. Software-based insulin pump company, which is cool because you can make changes to software a lot easier than you can make changes to hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, and so since we're not reliant upon the hardware to change, to make major changes, we can kind of do this in an iterative fashion. Um, you know, one thing and then another thing and then, you know, a, a, and build and build and build a better product as we go along. And, and like you said before, doing it slowly, carefully, looking, making sure that the changes are appropriate and working for everybody. So we're going to follow that sort of scientific process, but we're looking at a bunch of different things that we might be able to change or or make better based on feedback that we've gotten from our users. One of the things that the other pump companies are coming out with, or if they come out in 2021, is a a lower and different range, a target range or target number. Um, You know, Omnipod and Medtronic have said that it'll be lower than, you know, 115 or 110. It'll be down to 100. It might even be adjustable. Can you speak to what Tandem is looking on that? I think we're looking at a lot of different things. I do and full disclosure, as everybody knows, I come out of the, the University of Virginia Research School uh, Center for Diabetes Technology and working with Dr. Boris Kovachev and working with Dr. Mark Roton and Sue Brown and Stacey Anderson and really getting familiar with what is safe and where people can kind of push the limit and where you can't. I think that 112.5 that we've chosen as being a really safe glucose has been really safe for the majority of the population. And since we're designing for the majority of the population, it's been very successful. So I know there are people who want to choose differently and want tighter targets. Now, when you choose tighter targets, whether it's 100, you know, some people want 80, things like that, you're going to have to trade off some hypoglycemia. And as a product that gets approved for vast majority of patients, when you increase hypoglycemia, you are inviting adverse events, right? You're inviting possible adverse outcomes. And so you have to be very, very careful and and almost ginger with that and what that's going to mean for your patients and for the whole population. So I approach that cautiously. And I think at Tandem, we're approaching that cautiously as to how do you do that without increasing hypoglycemia? Um, I think other people choosing those targets, you're going to see the trade-off with uh, increased hypoglycemia, at least that's what we've seen so far in uh, in clinical trials. You know, it's interesting because people listen to this podcast generally. Uh, we have found through the, the research that I've done 
you know, are extremely well educated, you know, very much take control of their diabetes in terms of even willing to do DIY stuff, right? It's a different population. Mm -hmm. So as you're listening and you're thinking, well, I I want to ride 82, you know, all day long, give me that flexibility. I'm wondering, you know, how do we balance that as you're saying with the 99% of people with diabetes, type one and type two, who may use this pump, who don't have access to the education or the time to look into it or, you know, many, many, many factors that increase that chance of hypoglycemia, as you said. But the other hand, it's a selling point. And other pump companies are already saying we're going to be better, right? Or we're going to be more flexible. And I don't know if that's even a question for you, Molly, in the position you're in, but it is something that I, I guess you really have to take into consideration. You do. And I, I can speak more philosophically about this than I can <laughs> anything else, but, you know, particularly as a diabetes educator and as someone with diabetes, hugging that line at 80 or 82 or whatever someone wants to do, you do have increased hypoglycemia. So the most relevant experience I have to pull from is pregnancy, right? During pregnancy, we ask people to stay, you know, at a very controlled, which, you know, is a, is a little bit like magical thinking, because it's very, very difficult when you've got all these hormones raging and everything going on and you're sick this minute and you're hungry the next and all this stuff is going on. I spent a miserable amount of time in hypoglycemia. This was before any automated insulin system, okay. right? So my daughter just turned four, so we could do the math and she's my youngest. So I, no, nothing was on the market at that time that would have helped me, but that with preventing that, but it, it, in letting me ride that really close line of, you know, let's hang out at 72 all day. I personally thought that was a miserable experience, whether it's the neuroglycopenia, right? So you're the lack of glucose to the brain where you're like, oh, I can't remember what's going on or what I need to think about next, or you're constantly treating hypoglycemia. Like it's not a trade-off I would take lightly. It's a risky trade-off. And I would say for, for people who are comfortable being in that space, that's fine. And that's a very small amount of people, right? Yeah. And if you can hug 82 all day with, a, you know, whether it's doing some sort of low carb diet and intense exercise or, or what, what have you, that's awesome. You're also not the majority of the population, right? So while I can appreciate that people want that and they want to be able to, to set a much lower target, you know, people with euglycemia, right? Without diabetes don't have that either. People with, uh, without diabetes do have, you know, 30, 40 point range sometimes with meals and things like that happening. So it's not, it's perfection that I don't know uh, is a realistic ask for someone with diabetes. Now, people who can do this and do this all the time, I guarantee you they're spending a tremendous amount of time and thought on it. Again, if you want to do that and you can do that and that works for your sanity, then please, by all means. But for a lot of people, you know, like we have other things that we are going to be focusing on and it's not going to be diabetes 24 seven. And the goal of an automated system is to relieve some of that burden. So you know, it kind of depends on like, are you okay with the trade-off being low? Are you okay with more management, with being more involved? A lot of that's just, just going to be decisions, personal decisions someone's going to have to make. But I wouldn't say that the lower target is necessarily advantageous for, for a large population. Okay. As you listen, I know you were screaming at me to go back to bolus by phone. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't let it slip by. Let's talk about that because the app came out uh, spring-ish of last year for general users. And it's great to look at. People love the information. Talk to me about if you can tell us a timeline or any information about Bolus by Phone. Yeah. So one of the cool things about my job is that I get to work with the human factors department. And we have really good human factors department at Tandem. And, and wait, let me stop you there. Human factors, because that always confused me. That means how people actually interact, like how stuff feels and looks and how you actually use it. And how you understand it and how logical is something to you, how intuitive is something to you. You know, something as simple as changing where in the menu structure you would put something. We test to see if trained, can people find this? Is this intuitive? Does this make sense to you? Um, if we use a new term, right, we test it to make sure that it's understandable. The thing my you know, this is a very much outside of the realm of insulin pump therapy. My favorite illustration of human factors is if you, you know, any hotel you've ever visited, you pick up the hairdryer and it says, do not use in the shower, right? <laughs> like someone did that. There was someone. I'm sorry to live. Yes. 
Somebody did that, right? There's, you know, crazy warnings. If you like pick up a pillow, it's like, you know, do not use while smoking or do not, you know, things like right. that. But where it did happen. So that warning has to occur. So if we change something with insulin pump therapy or we add a feature like bolusing from my phone, we have to test it very thoroughly to make sure it's safe, effective, understandable, and intuitive because not everybody's going to read the instructions. So we have just um, completed the mobile bolus testing, and we've done extensive work testing it in a number of different scenarios, people with type 1, people with type 2, pediatrics, where they're in charge, pediatrics, where the parent's in charge. You know, there's a wide range of people who uh, are using the system, and we need to test in all of those different user groups and get feedback. And it went really, really well, which was excellent, which means that it can then get submitted to the FDA. So I suspect that that will be happening somewhat early in 2021, first half of 2021, but I don't have insight or line of sight as to when that is promised because the FDA is so, so concerned with COVID right now, as they rightfully should be, and approving vaccines and things like that. So there's a little bit of a backlog there, um, and I don't know how that's going to affect our timeline, but we've been working really hard to get that out. We know people want it. We know people need it, and it will be a really useful feature. But it's been tested really well. So, and again, I'm, I get a little fuzzy sometimes on the details here. What kind of submission is this? I have learned in the last few years that there are different ways of submitting to the FDA. Some take longer to approve. I mean, we never know how long it'll take to approve, having said that. But there are some things that are like building on previous submissions. Is bolus by phone something so new that they have to look at it in a new way? Or is it building on something you've already asked them about? It's a good question. And I'm not part of the regulatory team that is involved in that strategy. I believe that we are building on our previous submission since this is an, an, an ACE pump, mm-hmm. an alternate controller enabled pump. And, the, and the, the way that the pump is built and the way that that is structured for regulatory purposes is that you build upon last submissions. But I can't speak with authority on that at this time. The other thing that we are very interested in as a household and a community is the what has been called the T-sport. Can you talk about where that is in the process? And that's the tiny tube pump, I guess I would call right. it. I'll link up a picture. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, we will we'll link up some more information. Um, but it's not quite a patch pump. There is still a little tube on it, but it's much smaller than the X2. And it's made to be worn kind of flush or flatter to the body. Right. And in, and the idea behind this is that you could have a variable uh, tubing length, right? Very, very short to where it's worn on your body to longer where you just put it in your pocket. So depending upon the patient needs, the reason that it is still has an infusion set is that we know, right, from feedback that if you have an occlusion with a patch pump, you take that patch pump off and you lose that insulin, right? And you lose that whole thing. If you can replace a site and not all of the insulin that's in, you know, in, contained therein, then that is an easier fix for somebody. It's also less expensive. So that's something that we've been very keen to keep. In addition, the, the idea that you might need a different angled set, so not everybody can use the same sets as successfully as others. Uh, this will allow for some variety there as well. Um, and so we're, we're pleased about that. And I can just jump in and kind of translate because I know you're, you have to be careful about what you can say. But as you're listening, if you're wondering what she's talking about, Omnipod goes in one way. There's not an angled set. There's not a steel set. There's not a different set. There are a few more options if you're using a tubed pump, if the inset on the pod pump doesn't work for you. And so there's also, as you mentioned, the insulin that's in the tubing, you can do, and I don't know if this is tandem approved, so maybe don't listen, Molly, but you can do separate site and tubing cartridge changes when you use a tubed pump, which is what we have done for years. So when he's out of insulin in the pump, we change the cartridge. When it's time to change the inset, we change the inset. We don't do those together. So, you know, advantages and disadvantages for each pump. I know Omnipod people love the things that are great about their pump, but those are the differences that you're talking about, just in case you can't get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> right, absolutely. And, and you know, we're big fans of choice at Tandem. So if something works for you, great, excellent. Yes. Um, and so one of the reasons that we're so big on choice is because not everything works for every person. So this will allow somebody some choice within that, uh, that option. So where are you in the, in, in the test? I know you can, you can rarely give us full details, but where are we in terms of T-Sport? Is it, is it in testing? Is it, is it coming out soon? 
I can't speak to the exact timeline. And part of that is because the FDA is bogged in and down mm. in COVID right now, but we are working on it. I know we're working from a human factor perspective. We're working on what the difference is going to mean for the patient and training for something like this, or for the healthcare provider and training and something like this. And that's the aspect that I'm involved in is, you know, how do you train on something that's a little bit different like this? And how do you change the training to adapt to that? But everything is in development. The thing about control IQ and, and even basal IQ is right. They're already tested. So those can be implemented in a new form factor without any problems. So that's something that uh, we don't have to worry about. So it's more of just form and function and things like that. Here's a dumb question for you. I have heard that T-Sport is the name that you all are kind of using internally, and it may not have that name when it's released. Any update on the name? Is there an update on the name? Oh, I am not the person that would be able to tell you that. Oh, um, okay. But I appreciate the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have a contest and you could name it, you know, Pumpy McPumpface or something. But yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or Shorty. I mean, yeah. It was, yeah. Shorty. <laughs> that's perfect. I was laughing when we talked about that this summer because it, it's interesting and it's such a wonderfully privileged place that I'm in, I feel like, where we find out this information so early in the process that the, the, the branding isn't really even set. So it's it, when I heard that, I thought, wow, what a cool place to be in. So very interesting stuff. All right. I have a few questions from listeners for you. I know you have some more information. We're getting kind of long here, but let me ask you, here's a quick control IQ question. And this is more advice. I don't know if you can answer this. So this person says, sometimes I like to set a higher basal in advance of when I work out because adrenaline makes my blood sugar spike. Can you change that so we can manually adjust basal rates without having to turn off control IQ? I know my body better than the software having to manually adjust with boluses after and having to guess since I can't do them based on blood sugar due to IOB issues is tricky. And I will jump in and say, Molly, Benny and I do this too. We do some guessing with the manual boluses. So I'd love to hear what you think about this. Sure. So there's a couple different directions we can go with this. One is you can turn control IQ off and on and do temp basal rates. And there's no penalty, right? For doing that. There's no learning time or restart up or, or anything like that, that impacts control IQ if you turn it off and on for those periods of time. So that is absolutely an option. It's just, it's super easy to do. Another thing that we've seen people do successfully is set up a secondary profile that is a bit more conservative or a bit more aggressive, depending upon the patient needs, and then switching into that profile for that period of time and leaving control IQ on. So there's a lot of different ways you could do this. You could even do a secondary profile and then put it into exercise, right? Like you could do conservative plus that temp basal rate, or you could do aggressive plus that temp basal rate. So all of that is is entirely possible. But knowing that you can turn it off and do the basal rate as you please, and then resume it confidently, you know, that's still an option for you. I do know that uh, people do want a bit more control over that. And so in, you know, allowing for some sort of ability to have a temporary basal rate is on the list of things that we would like to integrate. Another question was, I am still using basal IQ. And this person is really curious about what percent of tandem users are using control IQ. And, and you've kind of touched on this, but do you have any statistics about user satisfaction rates for control IQ? Yeah. So DQ&A, um, again, affiliated with Diatribe third-party source, you know, has done some user satisfaction surveys and I will get you the exact number, but this user satisfaction with control IQ is very high, uh, very, very high. And I would say the majority of people have changed over to control IQ, but there are still patients on base like you. And I can't speak to the exact percentage, but there are reasons why somebody may want to choose base like you to just have that suspension rather than um, also, uh, you know, having the, the auto correction or something like that. So there's cases for both and that's why they're both still being offered. But I can't speak to the exact number of people who have not switched over, but most people are switching over to control IQ. Are there any plans to make it more flexible in terms of switching back and forth? Because once you go from basal IQ, we did this, once you put the software in your pump and switch to control IQ, you can't go back to basal IQ. Are there any plans to to change that? Not at this time. The reason being is that um, you would need a script, right? A Mm. a prescription to do that. And when you uploaded your pump or you went to your provider, if you went between one thing and another and another and another, 
all the time, we would really have to differentiate those uh, reports and make sure that the, the healthcare provider was familiar with why each was different because they would impact how you would titrate insulin. So it, it adds a lot of complexity on the therapy end. And so we have not made a move to, to make that um, something that you could toggle between. Got it. And another question came in, which I thought was really interesting about accessibility for people who are blind. And I know in the past, there was a meter that I think talked, uh, you know, there was more audio. Is Tandem looking at more accessibility for people who don't have any vision or low vision? Yeah, yeah. So Tandem is making technology user-friendly for those with different abilities. And we're, we're absolutely have this on our radar, uh, persons with low vision or no vision, right? Using mm. a touch screen could be difficult. And we're exploring ways to leverage apps and existing consumer technology that might be able to solve those unmet needs. It's definitely, definitely something that we are looking at and can appreciate that that's something that we need to do. Very cool. Another question came in, and this is based on an older press release, so I'm not sure if you can speak to it. But apparently, JDRF in tandem years ago, like eight years ago, put out a news release about a dual hormone insulin pump. What we're seeing, if you're familiar with the eyelid, beta bionics, I think is the only one, at least in the U.S., where they're trying to develop a pump with insulin and glucagon with more stable glucagon now on the market. Any chance that Tandem is working on a dual chambered pump? So the big message here is that that eight years ago, I think for the press release was when Tandem was being used with two separate pumps in the the eyelet studies. Oh, right, that's right. right. They were yeah. using the tandem pumps and one was full of glucagon and one was full of insulin and they were putting yeah. two pumps on one person. I remember that picture. Wow. So that's where that came from. So, um, but our, our micro delivery technology is really well suited for two hormone therapy. We currently are only approved for U100, right? Insulin and only indicated for insulin per FDA. But, you know, it's a fundamental challenge for people developing dual chamber devices. And there's not an approved hormone available for use in pumps at this yeah. time. So it would all be very investigational. But we do have, you know, this micro delivery technology, which is well suited for doing something like dual hormone. But I think there's a lot of things that need to get addressed before even that becomes something that we can put in a trial. And then something that I started talking about this summer, I've mentioned this interview with I did with uh, Steph Habif from Tandem, and I will link that up. It was kind of, we called it the first look under the hood for Control IQ that we did yeah. this summer. And she's the uh, Senior Director of Behavioral Sciences. But we brought up um, some of the questions about who gets into clinical trials and who actually tests these things out and the information that you get in terms of diversity. And so this question, the, here I'll read the whole question from a listener. I've heard some rumblings that most of the people who tested Control IQ were white. I would love to know about Tandem's plans to diversify this more. This is a huge issue in general for trials of any kind. And Steph, this summer, started to address that in terms of Tandem knows it. They're trying to be more diverse. Can you follow up on that and let us know what's going on? Yeah, and your listener question is totally right on, right? The FDA is on this as well. They recently told Moderna, uh, you know, you have to go back with your COVID uh, vaccine and get more people, right? You have to get people of diverse uh, backgrounds and and, uh, ethnicity. And so uh, that's true in clinical trials overall need to be all more inclusive. And it's true that most um, automated insulin delivery trials to date have been largely white. And that includes our adult pivotal trial. One of the things we're seeing changing from both an FDA perspective, as well as research and industry, is that there's active pivoting to change the approach and there's more guidance on changing the approach. Um, the FDA has issued um, guidance on diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, which I'm sure you could post in the show notes, but that's a really interesting sort of, hmm. if you will, mandate from the FDA to please be more inclusive. But for those in the community who may have attended the DData event from Diabetes Mine, and I can send you a link to the YouTube uh, video, Dr. Bren Marks, who's at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C., presented on diversity and inclusion specifically in diabetes technology research. And it was very illuminating on how white those trials are, right? And what we need to do to better accommodate and to be more inclusive in a lot of different communities. From a TANA perspective, we are very committed to this, particularly in our post-market studies. We encourage principal investigators to do the same who are looking at different research and the FDA is mandating it. So it absolutely will be happening, right? 
if the FDA says you will be providing a trial with this type of diversity, you will be doing that. So mm-hmm. I think that the that everybody is aware that this needs to happen and we're trying to figure out how best to do it and be responsible stewards and in industry. But for a long time, you're right. I mean, you know, diabetes technology and automated insulin delivery trials were largely white. You know, you have to be able to take off of work, right? Whether you're bringing your kid to your appointment or not. And so those are jobs with that allow some flexibility. Um, you have to be able to afford to miss work, right? You have to have paid some sort of leave, whether it's sick or personal days. And, and all of that does impact the person that you recruit, right? So being able to alleviate some of that, maybe it's provide compensation. The FDA suggested providing compensation for parents that can't take off time from work or you know, meeting people where they're at, whether it's in uh, qualified public health centers or at schools or wherever, to make it easier for them to attend, uh, whether it's clinic appointments or whatnot, but meet people where they're at and, and have people run the research that look like the people who will be in the research, right? Yeah. So diversify that field as well. There's a lot that needs to be done here. And Tandem is absolutely committed to making this a priority. That's great to hear. I'm I'm interested in following up more about it, not just with Tandem. You know, I feel like it's also a question of finding people who, you know, I have the same frustration with this podcast. How do I reach new communities? How do I find people who would maybe benefit from the information but don't know I exist? Because I don't run in in those circles, right? I mean, we tend to run in the same circles and we need to branch out and and not make people find us, but, you know, but find them. Right. So it's really, I think it's also a question of finding more, look, I, I'm not an expert on this by any means, so I probably shouldn't speculate, but it's also a question of, you know, finding staff that is of different races, me finding more guests that are of different races and are of, in, you know, are in different communities. It's for us to do the work, not to ask them to come to us. And so I'm really glad that Tandem is doing that and is on top of that. So thanks for answering that. Yeah, yeah, there's a sea change coming in, yeah. in society and diversity and inclusion, and that will absolutely be tra- translated at tandem. Boy, we've been talking for a long time. You've been really generous with your time. Just another quick question from a listener, um, and that is about the mobile app. I'll be honest with you, Benny doesn't use it a lot. He says he's waiting for Bolus by phone, but, it, but someone said it wasn't that fast in terms of uploading. Have you heard about that? Is that something that you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. And the reason that um, I think some people are experiencing that is that they haven't downloaded their pump in some time. And right. So whenever it last downloaded, it's going to append that data going forward. And so if you have a year's worth of data or you have six months worth of data that's not gotten to the cloud, that takes a while to get up there. So if you could download your pump first, um, if you've not downloaded in a long time to T-Connect or upload your pump rather, then that sort of relieves that burden to append the, all the data that has never been there before. So if you could do that and then let it sync day after day, it will be much faster. It'll be much, much faster. I remember the last time we did that. I should probably get on that, but that's, yes, that's definitely do. a good explanation. <laughs> Hey, really, before I let you go, Molly, we haven't spent a lot of time on this interview because you, you've been generous in the past and come on the show for really many years now. But I haven't spent time talking to you about your personal experiences. But as you mentioned, you know, you've been in this community, not just living with diabetes, but you've been in the testing for the artificial pancreas projects for, for what has become Control IQ for a very long time. Would you mind if I asked you just one more time, what is this like for you? We've had this elusive piece of software in the market with real people using it for a year. You've been testing it for, I want to say, almost 10 years. What is that like for you? Yeah, yeah. It's professionally 10 years and personally for 14. So it's a bit of a a surreal experience, Mm. but it's also, it's very cool because I can see the improvements that need to be made and I can see how they can be made. and. It's been really, really cool to teach healthcare providers in particular, which is a big part of my job about reading the data and looking at insulin needs and how do you make this work with control like you, or how do you make this work with basal like you, or how do you make this work easiest for your practice? And it's just been, uh, just to put it into practice has been really awesome because it's, we do get notes from users on social media and otherwise about how it's impacted their life and that they feel like a normal person now. And that's all I've ever wanted, right? As a person with diabetes is to like, Give me back my personhood where I'm not thinking about diabetes 24-7. And I feel like Control IQ does that. 
Um, you know, it's not, is it the be all end all? No, we will improve <laughs> upon that. But um, you're never done, right? But the fact that so many people have expressed that has been really rewarding. And I really want to see that carry forward in, in all of our products that we relieve, reduce burden for people with chronic disease. There's no other disease in the world where we ask somebody to do all the things we ask in diabetes. You know, if you have a heart condition, we don't ask you to beat your own heart. Okay. You know, we don't, there's nothing else that we ask this much of people. And then that we possibly make them feel bad or shame them for not achieving these things, which is kind of crazy. And so reducing that burden and making this a more realistic disease to manage is all I've ever wanted. Well, I can't thank you enough for your personal participation in testing this out for years and years, as you said, 14 years, and for being so accessible and coming on to answer all of these questions. So Molly, thanks so much. I look forward to talking to you more. I look forward to more improvements and exciting releases from Tandem. I know you'll all keep us posted. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Lots more information in the show notes. I'll link up uh, some helpful things from Tandem and more information for you. And I did have a couple of follow-ups. As you heard, Molly uh, couldn't answer every question I had. So I got a couple of notes from Tandem that I want to share with you now. Bolus by phone was submitted in the third quarter of last year. Uh, that is called Mobile Bolus. I don't know if there's a branded name for it. I did ask about that, but I, I hadn't heard back. But that has been submitted. It's in front of the FDA right now. They're hoping to hear back in the first half of 2021. You know, it's hard, as, as Molly did say, with COVID, delaying everything. It's going to be really hard to tell, as always, when the FDA will approve these things. But I'm so excited about that. And I'm interested to see what it looks like practically. I'm going to say this with no knowledge of what was submitted. I do not have an inside track on what it would actually look like. So this is my speculation. You know, I imagine you just take out your phone and use it like your pump, right? You can, you'll have the full functionality. I don't know if that's really the case. I would imagine the FDA might be cautious. I don't know. But uh, man, I just envision Benny, you know, he's got his phone in his hand half the day anyway. So beep, beep, you know, let's go. <laughs> Maybe that'll be their branded name for it. Beep, beep, let's go. Uh, they also let me know that Tandem is still planning to submit the T-Sport to the FDA in the first half of 2021. And they are hoping for a quick turnaround, possibly launching by the end of this year, which would be really exciting and nice to have another option there. And a listener asked me about this. I didn't get it in time for this interview, but I did have a chance to ask Tandem about their agreement with Abbott. If you'll recall, Tandem and Abbott have an agreement to integrate with the Libre, not just with the Dexcom. So there is apparently no update on that right now, but they are anticipating having one. In the fourth quarter of 2021, we talk a lot about interoperability on this show. And, you know, of course, the dream is if a certain CGM isn't working for you and another works better, you'll be able to slap that on and press a button on the pump. I don't think it's going to be that easy, but maybe down the road. I really do hope that we'll have more options. But if you had asked me five years ago if the pump market would look like it's about to look right now, I think I would be pretty happy about that. Not just because of the great technology that's here from Tandem and, you know, we've been talking about what's next for Medtronic and Omnipod, but because we have more pump players coming to market. I am so excited to be talking to the folks from Beta Bionics and from Bigfoot later on this year. So we will keep you posted. Innovations coming up next. Speaking of moving forward, we're going to be talking about exercise and CGM new guidelines for that and rare diabetes. Could this be you? It's really interesting what they're saying here. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And we have been using the Dexcom G6 since it came out and we love it. It is amazing. The G6 is now FDA permitted for no finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. We've been using the Dexcom for seven years now and it just keeps getting better. The G6 has longer sensor wear, that 10-day wear now. The sensor applicator is so much easier to use than it was in the past. We do love those alerts and alarms and that we can set them how we want. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. <music> I ran across something I thought was really interesting for our innovations segment this week, and that is the Radiant study. I will link this up, but Radiant is recruiting people 
who have been diagnosed with diabetes, but they don't fit the usual characteristics of type 1 or type 2. Apparently, this is not uncommon. I mean, most people really fit into the type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. You know, you've heard of LADA and 1.5 if you've listened to this show, but many types of diabetes are unknown, called atypical diabetes. And I really have never heard anything about this. So there's a new study called RADIANT, which stands for Rare and Atypical Diabetes Network. And they want to discover more about what's going on here. You know, how do we better help these people? How do we treat this stuff? There's a lot more information on who qualifies or how do you know. I will link that up in the show notes. Please check it out and let's spread the word because this is really something that I think could make a big difference for people who are, you know, misdiagnosed or aren't getting the most from their treatment. Like, oh, it sounds like you have type two, but this isn't working for you. Let's get the word out and check out that link. The other story in Innovations is about new guidance for people with type one and using continuous glucose monitoring for exercise. So there hasn't been a lot of information about this, you know, how to use your CGM to safely and and really exercise well. So this is new guidance from the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, basically the European counterpart to the American Diabetes Association. And that second group has a a narrower focus on, on younger people, as you would assume from the name. But there are a lot of American researchers that you've heard of as the co-authors on this, like JDRF CEO, Dr. Aaron Kowalski, and Dr. Bruce Buckingham, who we just adore on this show. So anyway, there's a lot of information on this. I'm not going to go through what it says because I will link it up in the show notes and on the episode homepage. But it really gives you guidance in terms of if this, then that, but also allowing for the complexity because everybody with diabetes is just a little bit different, especially your exercise is going to be different too. And what I really like is it's not just about the exercise in the moment. They also talk about what to do later in the day and overnight. So good guidance here. Our innovations segment is for tips, tricks, hacks, studies, new stuff in the community. I also have our Tell Me Something Good, which will return next week. Please make sure you send me your good news stories for that. I have a bunch that I've been holding on to. Can't wait to share next week. But I always like to hear from you. You can reach me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com or drop into the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group, and let me know what's going on. Before I let you go, quick reminder that the Fearless Diabetic Summit is happening at the end of this month. This is a virtual summit that is free. You got a bunch of speakers. The videos are made. I was so excited to participate in this. And you can watch them for free for a couple of days, as many as you want. And then after that, there is a fee to access, but you can check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes. But I think this is a great idea. You can get kind of the appetizer and see what you like about it. And then if you want to delve further, you can go ahead and, you know, and pay for the content. I was not paid for my involvement. I was excited to take part. I do have some goodies and freebies and stuff like that for people who are participating. So you can check that out. Also, mine, I think, is the only parent video that's in there. But there's lots of great information from athletes and endos and CDs, you know, regardless of age. Also, if you have a podcast or you're thinking of launching a podcast, diabetes or otherwise, watch my social posts. Because by the time this episode airs, my new venture should be out there. I am taking the dive to help other podcasters uh, learn how to talk to sponsors, how to make money, frankly, from their shows and how to do it ethically. And well, there's a lot of snake oil out there. It's a lot like diabetes. There's a lot of not so great players out there in the podcasting space. And I'm excited to kind of help give people good advice that can help them get great shows out there and make them solid and make them more than a hobby. So watch for that. All right, lots to come. We're getting a great response for this tech-heavy emphasis in 2021 because, my goodness, there's a lot out there. But we have much more than that. I'll be talking to some people with some great stories as well. And as usual, if you've got one or you have something or a topic you'd like to hear, please reach out. I'm here for you. This podcast is to help, you know, share our stories and get great information out there in this community. And if I'm not serving you, then I am not doing my job. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. Say a prayer for me as Benny is now behind the wheel. I, gosh, I did not know how nervous I would be about this day. I think I'm doing all right. We'll see. All right, I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. 
All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.